not trying to overstate what this says. We all know that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and no one saves but Jesus. Uh, this is simply an interesting thought. None of you by giving the gospel, not me by giving the gospel, has ever saved anyone. It's the, it's the work of Christ on the cross, His death, burial, and resurrection that is salvific. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, read that. When you, arri when you arrive in heaven, somebody, you know, it's Facebook. When you arrive in heaven, I wonder if Christ might say, because of you, others are here today. Want to meet them? Wouldn't that be an interesting thing? If there's a moment in heaven where everybody that you've led to the Lord, where God's given you the benefit, uh, the great blessing of, having, of being able to converse with somebody, introduce them to their Savior, Jesus Christ, their need for a Savior, wouldn't it be a fantastic moment, just personally, not something where everybody says, yay, look what he did. That's not what we're talking about. But wouldn't it be fantastic if you could see, if God would give you a moment to see that group over there, all 228 of those, you gave those people the gospel. They believed because of your courage in, uh, in sharing Jesus Christ with them. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. We shouldn't be either. Just an interesting, uh, an interesting thought I ran across. Maybe it will happen, maybe it won't. Doesn't matter if it does, but it sure would be neat, wouldn't it? Some highlights so far in chapter 14. We've been in 1 Samuel chapter 14. Uh, some highlights, King Saul's son. Remember, Saul is the king of Israel. It's his son, Jonathan, that has taken his armor bearer uh, with him. There's only a two-man attack going on here. Jonathan realizes God wants the Philistine army destroyed, and Jonathan takes it upon himself, knowing that he's working and walking with Yahweh here. He gathers his armor bearer and says, let's go. And so they attacked the camp of the Philistines, these two men, and they killed about 20 men. What else is going on here? As a response to Jonathan's courage, Yahweh gets involved in the war himself. Very directly, he causes an earthquake to further terrorize and terrify would be the word. Terrify, not terrorize, to terrify the Philistines. And let the Jews and let the Philistines know that the Jews aren't fighting alone. This isn't simply a man-to-man -man battle. God is fighting here. And so their God, the Jewish God, Yahweh, is fighting alongside them. How many times did David say, and other people say in the Bible, the battle is the Lord's. And here God made it clear by bringing this earthquake on. We also saw in chapter 14, King Saul makes this ridiculous demand of his army. He horribly weakened his army of men, 600 men, by saying, Now the men of Israel, look what it says in verse 14, The men of Israel were hard-pressed, a Hebrew word that means they were fatigued, they were exhausted, they were in battle. And they were exhausted on that day because Saul, their king, their leader, their general, their commander-in-chief had put the people, the army, under an oath. And this is what Saul's oath was. Cursed be the man who eats food before evening. How in the world can you starve an army? Cursed be the man who eats food before evening. And until I have avenged myself, not Yahweh, myself, on my enemies, the Philistines, and so none of the people tasted food. He starved his army. The, the man who's supposed to be taking care of his army starves the army of Israel. Jonathan, another highlight, Jonathan doesn't know because he's fighting the Philistines. He's in the camp of the Philistines. Jonathan doesn't know that his father has made this oath with the army. So what does Jonathan do? But he takes some honey on the end of his staff, grabs it off the staff, puts it in his mouth, and he eats the honey and his eyes are brightened. Remember what it says here. He's restored to strength. Jonathan said in 1 Samuel 14, verse 29, My father, when he finds out, Jonathan, you're not supposed to eat. Your father put the army under an oath. Jonathan says, What an idiot my dad is. My father has troubled the land. My father's not walking with Yahweh. You could, oh, he could, you could just as clearly see that in Jonathan's mind that Yahweh is with me, Yahweh is causing an earthquake, Yahweh is moving with the people of Israel against the Philistines, and my father did what? 
He weakened the army of Israel when Yahweh has given them into our hands today. He says, My father has troubled the land. See now how my eyes have brightened because I tasted a little of this honey. How much more? This man would have been a great king. How much more if only the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of the enemies which they found? For now the slaughter among the Philistines has not been great. The Philistines, Jonathan is saying, will not be completely destroyed the way Yahweh wants them to be because of my father. He weakened the army today. And the destruction of the Philistines, the slaughter has not been great and it won't be great because the army can't continue chasing them and continue slaughtering them because they don't have any physical energy because dad said you can't eat. A frustrated son. A frustrated son of a foolish father. The last thing we saw is that the army killed animals. Once they saw Jonathan start eating from the honey, they warned him not to, or they warned him about the oath, the people or the army is so hungry that they start slaughtering these animals without, uh, without letting the blood drain. They laid them on the ground. They slit their throats. They cut the meat out. We don't know how they cooked it, whether they cooked it, but they are ravenous and they start eating this food, this meat, with the blood still in it. I showed you from Leviticus how a Jew's not to eat. Nobody is to eat the blood of an animal. And yet they did. And that's the disaster that Saul's oath caused the people. Uh, verse 36 is where we left off last week with the priest Ahiah. Remember, Saul has the priest with him. He has the ephod with him. At least the ephod, the, the high priestly ephod, if not the Ark of the Covenant itself. But at least the ephod, if not both. So Saul decides after the people have uh, eaten that he needs to go into battle. Look what it says in verse 36. Later the same day, verse 36, Then Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night. Let's fight all through the night. An exhausted army just got some food in their belly. Saul says we need to keep going. Who is he forgetting to ask? Who is Saul forgetting to ask about whether to continue into battle or not? How many times did King David say, Ask of the Lord, shall I go against the Philistines today? Will you give them into my hand? See, Saul's not stopping to ask Yahweh anything. Remember earlier in this verse, the high priest has his hand in his, in his breastplate. He's consulting with the Lord with the, the stones, the Urim and Thummim. And, uh, and Saul says, take your hands out, withdraw your hands. I no longer have to uh, hear from the Lord. I know what to do. Uh, Saul, just a disaster. So Saul's decision, not Yahweh's decision, as we'll see in just a second, is we need to continue fighting the Philistines. We need to take spoil among them until the morning light. Let's fight all night long, you exhausted army. And let us not leave a man of them. He wants to destroy them all. And they said, do whatever seems good to you. So Saul directs the army, commands, charge, we need to go in. The army says, okay, we'll do it. You're our commander in chief. You're our king. We'll do it. But the high priest says, wait a minute. That's not how Israel functions before our God. So the priest Ahiah says, let us draw near to God here. We're not going to take, take another step in battle before we speak to the Lord. The high priest here, Ahiah, takes control of the situation. Again, Saul here is eager to, eager to go back to battle, not having any concern for what Yahweh's will is here. So the priest stops Saul to remind him of two things. Number one, Yahweh's desire should be sought before entering war. I'll show you the verse in just a second. We must consult our God before we enter war, before we enter any battle. We have to consult our God through the Urim and the Thummim, these stones in the breastplate. That's the way God set it up. And the priest has to stop King Saul from making another blunder. And number two, Yahweh must be consulted. Number two is the priest commands Israel when to enter battle, not the political leader. 
It's not up to the king to say charge. It's up to the priest to speak to the Lord, to get a word from the Lord through the Urim and Thummim. And then the priest says, Yahweh has given them into your hands. And then the, the army goes to war. That's the order of battle. It should be our order of battle. Again, how many times did David go to the Lord before he did anything? David is a man after God's own heart to went, who went to Yahweh first to seek his desire. Saul is just the opposite. He seeks his own desires. I must be avenged. And lays aside the desires of the living God. What am I talking about? Just for a minute. His glasses are driving me nuts. Just for a minute, this Urim and Thummim, I've mentioned Urim is U-R-I-M. You see it in the Bible, Thummim, T-H-U-M-M-I-M, -M -M. Urim and Thummim. And I'm telling you, they're one of the mysteries in the Bible. Mysteries meaning we're not, we're not given enough information about exactly how these stones worked. We just know that God would, that the Jews would cast lots and God would let them know His direction, His will by these stones. Look what the Bible says here. Uh, this is the high priest ephod. And this is the breastplate. This item right here, the Bible speaks about it, and all those 12 stones, the different colored stones, amethyst, all the different things that they are, uh, each stone represents one of the tribes of Israel. There's only one of these suits in all of the world at any given time. It's the suit that belongs to the high priest. There is another, just for a, a, a current event statement, even though the temple isn't in existence and the, the garments of the high priest from the ancient temple have been lost, Israel has uh, the garments of the high priest in place ready to go. There is a place in Jerusalem today called the Temple Institute, and there are, there's a group of Jews who are ready to rebuild the temple. They're gathering all the things needed to rebuild the temple uh, they're gathering the, the sacred oils for the, for the uh, offerings. Um, they've built the, the um, altar. They've built the, uh, the, the basin for cleansing the priest. They have all the elements ready to go. They have a golden menorah that they've built, the menorah, the lampstand. They have the items to go, this golden altar that you see here, the altar of incense. They've already built all these things. They're ready to go. They just need the clearance to tear down the Islamic dome of the rock so they can build their temple. Who's going to give that clearance? God will one day, but, but not until God gives the clearance. The, Jew, the, the Muslims aren't going to do it. Uh, so it's going to be something supernatural that one day occurs because this temple will be rebuilt during the tribulation. And they also have the priestly garments. They have them on display. You can go through this temple institute and see all these things. They put them on display. They're not hiding the fact that they're ready to rebuild the temple. The one thing they don't have, and if you go and do a Google search uh, under red heifer, Jewish or Israel red heifer, the one thing they don't have is the red heifer. And remember from, uh, I think it's in Exodus chapter 19. No, that's not right. It's in... It's in Numbers chapter 19 where God speaks about the red heifer, that you have to have this red heifer. You burn this red heifer. You take its ashes outside of the camp. You mix its ashes with water, with purified water. And it's this water, this ash, red heifer ash, that will purify and cleanse the people. And so uh, they don't have a red heifer in Israel. The red heifer has to be Jewish, has to be indigenous. It has to be uh, raised on Jewish land, and it has to be blemish-free. Uh, it has to be perfect. And Israel is always striving to find this perfect, to get, to breed a perfect red heifer. Uh, and God just hasn't allowed it yet, very interestingly. But you can go and see that. It's an interesting, uh, I think a Texas rancher was involved in donating uh, a red heifer some years ago that they're trying to get to, to breed on Jewish soil so they can have everything they need to rebuild the temple. Very interesting things going on in Israel. But this uh, ephod right here, it's a piece of material. It would be twice that long. It would go down to here. That piece of material is a rectangle. So if you loosened it, it would flop down to here. The stones would not be visible. I say that because when you lift it up, you make a little pouch, right? You folded it in half and there's a pouch. 
So there's a place where the priest can put his hands inside behind those stones and inside that breastplate. And that's where these stones, the Urim and the Thummim are inside the breastplate. Look what the scripture says in Exodus chapter 28, verse 30. You shall put in the breastpiece of judgment, the Urim and the Thummim. And they shall be over Aaron's heart, Aaron the first high priest, the brother of Moses. They shall be over Aaron's heart when he goes in before Yahweh, the Lord. And Aaron shall carry the judgment of the sons of Israel over his heart before Yahweh continuously. The Urim and Thummim are how God gives instruction through the high priest. Look what it says here in Numbers chapter 27. Numbers chapter 27 verse 21. Moreover, further instructions about this Urim and Thummim. Sometimes it's just called Urim, but it's speaking of both of them. Moreover, he shall stand before Eliezer the high priest, who shall inquire for him. Who is it that does the inquiring, and who is it that gives the command to go into battle, out of battle, out to battle, in from battle? Who gives the command? Is it the judge, is it the king, or is it the priest? The priest, or, or the, 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 the one, Joshua, this is speaking about Joshua here going into the land. And Joshua, who's given commission of the armies of Israel to lead Israel into battle, Joshua is not given the authority to say, charge, anytime he wants to. Joshua takes his orders from the high priest of Israel, according to the scripture. Joshua, the leader of Israel, shall stand before Eliezer, the priest, who shall ask for him by the judgment of the Urim before the Lord. We don't know how, how these stones work to give the direction of God, but that's what they do. Yahweh gives his direction and his will through these stones. At his command... This is the priest's command when he uh, ascertains what lo the Lord is saying through the stones. At the priest's command, they shall go out, and at the priest's command, they shall come in, both he and the sons of Israel with him. Joshua is at the command of the priest and even all the congregation. So what we see in the scriptures is until the priest says, Yahweh says it's time to go out into battle, that go out and come in is a Hebrew phrase for battle, going in and out of battle. At the priest's command, when he hears from Yahweh through these stones, that's when he gives the command to the general, whoever's leading the army, Yahweh has given them into your hands, go, and then the leader takes the army into battle. The priest goes first. The spiritual leader of Israel is the one who, who makes the commands concerning battle. But on this day, it's King Saul who has decided, I'm going to do this my way. I know what God wants. He wants us to chase the Philistines all night long, even though I have an exhausted army. And the priest, knowing the scriptures, says, stop right there. That's not the way we do things in Israel. That's not what the law of Moses teaches Israel. We will go to the Lord through the Urim and Thummim, or we won't take another step. Thank goodness for this man, Ahiah, the priest, on this day. <clears throat> this will happen later in 1 Samuel chapter 28. Saul will inquire of Yahweh and Yahweh will not answer him. It says, when Saul inquired of the Lord, the Lord did not answer him. And how does the Lord answer? Either by dreams, this is Old Testament, dreams or by Urim, here are the priest's stones, or by the prophets. Yahweh had cut off communication from King Saul by uh, chapter 28. Somebody tell me because you know. So what did Saul do as a response to this event? Where did he go to find direction? Where did Saul turn to in the end of his life when Yahweh wouldn't speak to him? What was Saul's probably greatest blunder? He turns away from Yahweh and goes to the witch of Endor. He goes to a diviner. He goes to a soothsayer. He goes to some 
uh, black magic woman, and he demands that Samuel the prophet be brought up from the dead. And this is a, uh, that's what happens here at the end of that verse. At the end of that story, Saul goes to a false goddess, someone worshiping false gods, someone clearly working for the devil, not someone working for Yahweh. Yahweh is no longer conversing with Saul, either through dreams or by the Urim or by the prophet. Saul's been completely cut off, and so Saul turns to the pantheon of false gods and one of their people, the witch of Endor. David never does anything like that. So the high priest, that's what we're talking about. When Saul says earlier in the chapter, withdraw your hand, he was telling the high priest, take your hand out of your breast piece. I no longer need to hear from the Lord. I know what to do. Uh, and now he doesn't even ask the Lord. He goes, wants to go straight into night battle. And the priest, thank the Lord for the priest, says, no, that's not what we do here. Verse 37 so at the command of the priest, let us draw near to God here, Saul reluctantly does it. Saul inquired of God, Shall I go down after the Philistines? You hear this, this uh, uh, phrase often by many of the kings that go to the priest, Shall I go against the Moabites? Shall I fight against the Ammonites? Shall I go against the, all the people? And here Saul does it. Shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you, Yahweh, give them into the hand of Israel? But he did not answer him on that day. This is the first time that Saul has reached out to Yahweh and Yahweh was silent. God, <clears throat> oh, glasses. Yahweh is silent and he won't answer Saul through the Urim or any other way. The priest has his hands in his breastplate. The, pri the priest is waiting for these stones to do whatever they do. The priest is waiting for Yahweh to speak to Israel through him, through the priest, through the Urim and Thummim, and God is silent. No motion, no movement, whatever the stones do, no heat, whatever it is they do, we simply do not know. Don't make it up. We don't know. We don't have enough information. God didn't tell us. But whatever, however he uses these stones to answer, he did not. He was silent. He didn't answer the question, shall I go against the Philistines? So what should Saul have done? Not go against the Philistines. That should have been enough. But listen, uh, Yahweh is silent. Saul, what was his desire? He wanted to rush into battle. He wanted to take this exhausted army and go all night long to destroy the Philistines. And how do we see Yahweh respond? We don't see Him respond. We don't hear Him respond. He's absolutely silent. And so what is Saul's conclusion as we get to the end of the book, the end of this chapter? What is Saul's conclusion? If God is silent, now think of what I've told you about who King Saul is. This self-absorbed, uh, seeking his own revenge against the Philistines, not seeking the direction of God. That's who this man is. He's a crazed egotist, this Saul. Saul, Shaul. So what is Saul's conclusion when God is silent and won't answer the king when the king asks a question? What's Saul's conclusion? One of you people did something wrong. Who's innocent? In Saul's head, who's the one who's completely innocent, who's done nothing wrong, in his mind probably never done anything wrong? Who's innocent here? He is. It's somebody else's fault. You know anybody like that? You know any people like that in your lives where anything negative that happens in life, and let's face it, this is a world of trial and tribulation, Jesus promised us, but anything that happens, they're always, it was your fault, you did this, you did this, you did this. You are ruining my life by the way you behave. You're keeping all the blessings from me. That's King Saul. There are people like that. This Saul's not a one-off one and then God never made another one. There are people whose souls are exactly like this. <clears throat> never wrong. Always shift the cause. Always shift the blame to someone else. Anything negative in their life is always someone else's doing. God certainly never reaches them with discipline. It's the Adamic syndrome, isn't it? What did Adam say when God came to him and asked him, what did you do? What did Adam say? I can just see him stepping out of the heat there and pointing at Eve. 
There are men like that today. There are women like that today. It's this woman you gave me. The victim mentality. And some people live like victims, even though they won't actually admit to living like victims, seeing themselves as a victim the way they live is this King Saul mentality that anything negative that happens, it's somebody else's fault. I didn't do anything wrong. I don't remember ever doing anything wrong. And so what does Saul do here? He shifts the blame. Certainly it wasn't my oath. Certainly I haven't done anything wrong. Certainly commanding the priest to take his hand out of the urim and thumim out of the breast piece, certainly that wasn't wrong. I have done nothing to insult or, uh, or discredit my God in my actions in these days. It must be somebody else's fault. So Saul goes on this witch hunt to find out who the sinner is in Israel who's causing all these bad things to happen and for God to be silent. It's not Saul. Why didn't, Saul. why didn't Yahweh answer Saul? Look at what we hear out of Saul's own mouth. Remember, until I am avenged, no man shall eat until I am avenged of my enemies. Saul is on a personal vendetta here. Saul's going after the Philistines like it's his war instead of a holy war. This is God's war against a, a polytheistic, non-Yahweh-worshipping people. That's why God wants the Philistines destroyed. They're idols, idolaters. They're idol-worshipping, false God-worshipping peoples. This is holy war. But Saul sees it as a personal vendetta against the Philistines until I am avenged. So the question was, why didn't Yahweh answer Saul? Answer Saul? Why should he? Saul is trying to avenge himself in this war. He's not standing up for Yahweh against Yahweh's enemies. It's personal to him. He made it clear by his own words. And why would Yahweh support any man whose ways were not aligned with his own? Why would, Yah why would God support Saul in his efforts when Saul wasn't doing things according to the way God wanted them done? Why would God respond? God knows all things, Christian. Don't forget this. He knows the ways. He knows the intentions. He knows the thoughts. He knows our motives. He knows exactly what's in Saul's heart. And he's not going to let Saul go out and think he wins a battle on his own. He stops him cold in his tracks. And what do we see? The Philistines will continue to prosper, continue to live until the days of David when David comes and finally squashes them. Saul doesn't do what the Lord raised him up to do. Psalm 33, verse 13, the Lord looks from heaven. Saul wasn't uh, uh, excused from this. He wasn't in any other category of Jew because he was the king. He should have been following the Mosaic law closer than anyone else and becoming an, an uh, someone that the people could imitate. He should have been an example for the people of Israel the way Jonathan was, his son. But we hear in the scriptures here concerning Yahweh not answering Jonathan or, or Saul because he's not living and not walking in the way of the Mosaic law. It says the Lord looks from heaven. He sees all the sons of men, nothing hidden from him, all the sons of men, including Saul. From his dwelling place, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth, all of them, including Saul. And uh, he who fashions, another statement about who God is, he who fashions the hearts of them all, and he who understands all their works. There's nowhere to hide from this God. So God knows exactly what's going on in the heart of Saul. He's not going to support it. I'm not going to tell you whether to go into battle or whether not to go into battle. I'm not going to say anything to you today. 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, As for you, my son Solomon, great words of the king, David, as for you, my son Solomon, know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind. Why should you serve God with all your heart and all your mind? Because God knows everything. Why would you try to live a life that circumvents God and His omniscience? You can't do that. You can't hide from this God. You can't have some thought and motivation and think, oh, I'm going to look good and get away with this. You can't do that with God. You can pull the wool over mom and, mom and dad's eyes, can't you? 
until you're uh, all, almost eternally. Mom and dad, me, Amy, and my kids, they can easily pull the wool over our eyes. Can't pull the wool over God's eyes. Saul needed to learn this lesson, and I believe he's learning it right now in this chapter because of the silence of God and what will happen in just a moment. For the Lord searches all hearts. He understands every intent of the thoughts. If you seek him, he will let you find him, Saul. He should have... Oh, it's just so sad. If you seek him, like Abiyah said, we have Ahiyah, the priest, we have to stop and seek the Lord. We have to seek the direction of God. If you will seek him, he will let you find him. But if you forsake him... Saul, by saying, remove your hands from the breast piece. I no longer have to hear from God. If you will forsake him, he will reject you forever. And we've already seen Saul rejected because of what he did earlier. Rejected by God who says, I'll raise up a man after my own heart. It will not be you, Saul. One more verse in Jeremiah 17, 10. The Bible says, I, the Lord Yahweh, search the heart. I test the mind even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the results of his deeds. So what did Saul earn this day? Silence from God. I will give to each man according to his ways. Saul's ways were wrong. God gave him what he deserved. Silence. A terrifying position to be in. I mean, you have the high priest of Israel and you're in right here beside you and you're asking him to ask of the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Jewish God. You're asking the high priest of the Jews to speak to the Jewish God through the Urim and Thummim and the Jewish creator God is silent. Terrifying. And what's Saul's conclusion? Which one of you messed me? Which one of you did me wrong this time? Which one of you did this? That's his conclusion. There's no introspection. There's no uh, looking into his own deeds. There's no wondering, could I have done this wrong? Was that oath wrong? Should I have waited for the priest to give a, a word through the Urim and Thummim? Have I done anything wrong? Some people, their immediate reaction is this right here. You did it. You did it. You did it. Certainly wasn't me. And that's where we see King Saul here. If you... Seek him, you will find him. But if you reject him the way Saul has, he will give to each man according to his ways. And what does Saul get today? Silence. Verse 38, Saul said, draw near here. God is silent. So what is Saul going to do about it? He says, draw near. Every one of you little plebes, gather around. This is just an atrocious soul investigate and see how this sin has happened today. Someone has sinned against God, and that's why God isn't answering me. And in verse 39, another foolish oath from a fool. For as Yahweh lives, and God surely does live, for as the Lord lives who delivers Israel, Though it is Jonathan, my son, even if it's Jonathan who has sinned and allowed God, caused God not to answer me, he shall surely die. But not a man of them, not one of all the people answered him. Remember when Jonathan ate of that honey, uh, there were several people who knew that he had done it. And I imagine here the last thing they're going to do is call out their hero and say, it's Jonathan that broke the oath. So what Saul is saying here is, even if it's my son Jonathan who's done something wrong against Yahweh to make me look bad, to make Yahweh not speak to me today, even if it's my own son, today I'll kill him. This is a madman. Talk about a self-absorbed egotist. And I think also you can see from this verb, uh, from this verse, that King Saul's arrogance led him to believe that not only was he above doing anything wrong, but even his son Jonathan, it seems, was above doing anything wrong. He wasn't trying to condemn himself to death, his son to death. He was saying, My son didn't do it either, because he's of the family of Saul. 
untouchable. Can't do wrong. So what do we see? Verse 40, Then he said to all Israel, You shall be on one side. I and Jonathan my son will be on the other side. And the people said, Do what seems good to you. Some of these people know what's about to happen. Therefore Saul said to the Lord, this is a command, this is an imperative mood in the Hebrew. Saul is making command of Yahweh. Listen to what I'm saying. Saul is making a command of God to show who the sinner is. Saul said to the Lord, the God of Israel, give, give is a command. Give a perfect lot. This is through the Urim and the Thummim. He's got the high priest. He's got the Urim and Thummim. That's how they're casting lots. Give a perfect lot, God. And Jonathan and Saul were taken. The people were freed, it says, but the people escaped. They were freed from guilt. They, their hand wasn't, uh, wasn't chosen. So God says it's either Saul or Jonathan here. Verse 42, Saul said, Cast lots between me and Jonathan, my son. And Jonathan was taken. It's interesting. Some people and, and types like this have great courage, even in foolishness. And here you see uh, uh, Saul, great courage in his foolishness. My son and I will be on one side and all you sinning rabble can be on the other side. And then all of a sudden it's Jonathan and Saul who are taken. And of course, Saul still the ever innocent one knows that it must be his son Jonathan because he's above reproach Saul himself. And Jonathan was taken. And then Saul said to Jonathan, tell me what you have done. What is your sin against God that is causing him not to answer me today? What have you done to ruin my day? Because it's always somebody else's fault that ruins the day of a guy like this. So Jonathan told him, and Jonathan said, I indeed tasted a little honey with the end of the staff that was in my hand. Here I am. I must die. The way the Hebrews constructed here, there are some choices about what Jonathan said. Jonathan may have acquiesced to the command of the king and said, Listen, Dad, you made a foolish oath, but... Uh, let rules be rules. Here I am. Kill me. I disobeyed your law. Uh, another way to look at it this uh, look at this is he may be asking a sarcastic question. Must I die today? Am I really going to die because I tasted honey today? You fool who weakened the army of Israel and kept us out of a Philistine battle. Am I really going to die today? You could interpret it that way just as easily. Your choice. Verse 44, Saul says, so Jonathan says, death. If that's what's, whether it's just a factual statement, I'll submit to the authority of my king, or whether it's sarcasm, are you really, are you serious about this? Whichever it is, and you know which side I stand on, Saul said, may God do this to me, and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. The king is trying to kill the hero of Israel. Uh, this is astounding. This is like the Americans in the American Revolutionary War, the war for independence. This would be like the Americans turning on George Washington and wanting to kill George Washington. This is their hero. Jonathan did this. And here the king says, by decree to Jonathan, his son, for tasting honey, you shall surely die, Jonathan. The king is trying to kill their hero for what Saul says is a sin against God. What is it that Jonathan did? Let me ask you a couple of questions. Here's the question. Did Jonathan sin against Yahweh and deserve death? What's the answer? Did he sin against God? If Yahweh, listen, this is the way we think through these things. If Yahweh would have demanded that no man of the Jewish army eat until evening, if God would have said this through the Urim and Thummim, then Jonathan would be guilty before Yahweh and he should die whether he knew about the oath or not. I told you he never heard about his father Saul's oath because he was fighting the Philistines already. 
But if God would have said it, whether he knew it or not, he would be guilty and he should die. Agreed? Absolutely. But the other question, was this oath to not eat given by Yahweh? No, it wasn't given by Yahweh. It was uttered by his father who sees who he says, my father has weakened Israel today. This was a demand from his father. Saul, King Saul demanded uh, this of the army so he could personally be avenged. That's how he started it. No man shall eat food until I am personally avenged. As if to say, you fight until you're exhausted, kill every Philistine. You can eat after they're all gone. I want them all dead so I can be avenged. That was Saul's crazy word, never Yahweh's word. So did Jonathan sin against the command of Yahweh? The answer is no. Jonathan didn't uh, sin against a command of Yahweh in any way. But you see in Saul's head what's going on here? In Saul's mind, his oath is to be treated like an oath from God. If you cross me, you die. And, and the king can't make an oath of such strength. But here's this crazy man overstepping his role as king, even to, con con uh, to condemn a man to death, his own son, because he ate a little bit of honey when he was hungry and his eyes were darkening because of his condition after fighting all day. Who kills the guy for being hungry and eating? Look what it says in verse 45. The people said to Saul, Who stopped Saul a minute ago from doing something foolish and going into night battle? Ahiah the high priest has to stop the king of Israel from doing something foolish. And now the people have to stop the king of Israel. Now remember, here's the irony. Listen to me. It's these same people who just a couple of years ago rejected Yahweh as being their king and said, we want a king, we want to be like all the other nations. We want a king to do what? To lead us out and to lead us back in. We want a king to lead us into battle. And look what Saul has done to destroy and weaken the army of Israel here. This is what the people wanted. But here in this verse we see this. The people said to Saul, when he condemns his son to death, must Jonathan die today? Who has brought about this great deliverance in Israel, King Saul? This isn't your victory. This is Jonathan's victory. He says, must King Saul, or, or I'm sorry, must Jonathan die? Who's brought about this great deliverance in Israel? Far from it. The people are telling the king, you're not going to touch our hero. You're not going to touch him. Uh, a mutiny is stirring. I wonder if the army of Israel would have pierced King Saul through on this day if he'd have considered killing his son Jonathan and commanded it. I wonder if we'd have seen Saul die on this day. What we see is King Saul back off when the army says, you're not going to kill our hero, not today you're not. Who is this man Saul? What a fool. So the people stand up. The priest has to stop him. Now the people have to stop him from slaughtering, from murdering his own son, for not sinning against God, but sinning against his own oath. Not even a sin. It's not a sin. So the people say, Must Jonathan die who's brought about this great deliverance and evil uh, in Israel far from it? This is what they say, As Yahweh lives. You made an oath. Uh, an oath. Remember what... what Saul just said, as the Lord lives, the God of Israel, who even if it be Jonathan, my son, he shall be killed. The people throw that phrase right back in his face. As Yahweh lives. This is our oath, king. As Yahweh lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground. For he, why? Why are they protecting Jonathan? Because Jonathan has worked with God this day. The people understand that the victory that Israel had, Yahweh was involved with it. Yahweh caused the earthquake. Jonathan was doing exactly what Yahweh wanted. He was leading Israel into battle to destroy God's enemy, the Philistines. And so if Jonathan is fighting with God, Yahweh, our God, why in the world would we kill Yahweh's man for the job, Jonathan? Not one hair of his head is going to fall today. 
So the people, it says, rescued Jonathan from who? From the king of Israel, his father Saul. The people rescued Jonathan and he did not die. Uh, look, a couple of more phrases. The Jewish army, we're still answering the question, did, John, did Jonathan sin against Yahweh and deserve death? Well, the Jewish army knows that he didn't. The Jewish army knows that the victory over the Philistines on this day came from Yahweh through the heroism of Jonathan and his armor bearer. You're not going to kill our hero, the one who walks with God, Saul. That means that Yahweh and Jonathan were like-minded. They were aligned in purpose to destroy the Philistines. Jonathan was doing what God wanted the king to do. So Yahweh and Jonathan were in alignment. They were like-minded in their purpose, in their desire uh, to destroy the Philistines. And there is another phrase that should be there. Oh, I was going to give you a verse. 1 Samuel 9, verse 16, Remember, this is the desire of God to destroy the Philistines. This is what it says. Through Samuel the prophet, About this time tomorrow I'll send you a man from the land of Benjamin. This was Saul. Samuel is being told by God, Tomorrow you will meet Saul, a man from the land of Benjamin. You shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel, and this man Saul will deliver my people from the hand of the Philistines. I'm raising up your king that you want, and the first order of business, I want the Philistines destroyed, and the king will do it. Remember, the king's not doing it. The king is sitting under his tamarisk tree. He's in a place of, uh, of, uh, of safety. And Jonathan is the one in the night that takes his armor bearer and says, let's go find out what's going on here. Let's approach these Philistines. God wants these people destroyed. Jonathan is doing that, and the army knows it. And that's why they protect him. Jonathan and Yahweh are in alignment with what they're doing, and that means that King Saul was out of line, not in alignment with the will of God, with his foolish oath, which was not Yahweh's will or desire. His oath, his decree, cursed is any man who eats today until I am avenged of my enemies. It was Saul that was wrong. What did Saul do? gathers all the people to say, which one of you people did me wrong? Why isn't Yahweh talking to me? What does Saul found out, find out by the end of it? It's me. Saul was actually, and I hope, I'm, I'm just hoping here, I hope that he got the picture on this day when his people and the army said against him, you won't touch this man, Jonathan. This is a big thing to go against not only their commander-in-chief, but the king of Israel, the anointed of Israel. Saul was actually working against the will of Yahweh by weakening the Jewish army with this foolish oath, hindering them from destroying the Philistines, which is exactly what Jonathan said, Today my father has weakened his country. So King Saul is the one who was out of line and the Jewish people had to rescue their hero from the clutches of the egotistic king who wanted him dead. So much for the strong, handsome, broad-shouldered king who would lead them into battle, huh? We reject Yahweh. We want a king like all the other nations. Boy, don't you know on this day they feel stupid. What have we done in rejecting the living God as being our king? Look at this guy. He wants to kill his own son, and we have to stop it. So much for that. Verse 46, Saul went up from, means he ceased, he stopped. At least on this day, he got the message. Remember I told you earlier, he was losing the faith of his army. He was losing the loyalty of his army. It's gone now. And he knows that if the army has to stop me from killing my own son, they're sure not going to obey my next command, but we need to go in and fight all night long. And so what does Saul, realizing that he's been uh, checked, like check and checkmate, Saul stopped pursuing the Philistines. He didn't have an army to pursue them with. Not on this day he didn't. 
and the Philistines went to their own place. By the grace of God, Jonathan had done enough and Yahweh had done enough to destroy the Philistines to where they ran away licking their wounds and Saul didn't chase them anymore. That's a gracious God. So Saul, hopefully, I hope, realizing his foolishness, and that Israel was backing Jonathan, not him. I hope that's the reason Saul stopped pursuing the Philistines. He knew God wasn't with him, the silent God who didn't answer him. If Yahweh gave the victory through Jonathan and Saul decreed that Jonathan must die, I'm hoping maybe, just maybe, Saul realized he was on the wrong side in this whole event. The entire event, Saul was on the wrong side. He wasn't fighting for Yahweh. He was fighting Yahweh's enemy, the Philistines, but doing it in a wrong way. A right thing, remember this? A right thing done in a wrong way is what Saul is doing. God wants the Philistines fought against and destroyed, but not the way Saul did it. And a right thing done in a wrong way is... It's wrong. It's wrong. It's wrong. And I hope that Saul realized that on this day, and that's why he stopped fighting and pursuing the Philistines. Saul made a foolish oath that should have cost Israel the victory, but if you take nothing more from this today, take this, yet Yahweh, even still Yahweh, but Yahweh. Saul makes these foolish oaths, and what does Yahweh do in response? He blesses the heroic acts of Jonathan and his armor bearer. He hears the groaning of the Israeli people and he grants them a great victory over Israel or for Israel over the Philistines. Great grace gift from God. He didn't grant them what their king deserved. He granted them what Jonathan deserved. A great victory over the Philistines this day. And like I say, I pray as we say, I pray that Saul had a come to Jesus moment of clarity here. I hope that he realized what he had done. And that's why he didn't fight into the night. I hope, I can only hope that he fell down on, on his knees before his father this day, before his creator, before his God and confessed all his foolishness. I pray that that's what this man did on this day. When the priest had to stop him, when his army and his citizenry had to stop him, I pray that's how it led this man. But we won't know till we get to heaven. These last few verses, I'm just going to read them quickly. They're a summary. They're a summary of Saul's military career as the king of Israel and a one-verse genealogy. That's what these last six verses are. They are a summary of Saul's continu of his entire military career as the king of Israel. It says, Now when Saul had taken the kingdom over Israel, he fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, against the sons of Ammon, Edom, the kings of Zobah, the Philistines, wherever he turned, he inflicted punishment. It wasn't always at his hand. It was great people like Jonathan that God was blessing. Certainly in this victory, it was Jonathan's heroism and role in, the, in alignment with God that God was blessing. But the king gets the credit for it, right? It's his army. He acted valiantly and defeated the Amalekites. It's an interesting question, uh, statement because in the next couple of chapters, we will see that this is one of the worst things that Saul did. He did not completely destroy all the Amalekites. He saved their king, Agag. He saved the choices of their animals. He didn't do that right either. But God in His great overshadowing of sin, this covering over sin the way God does, He still gives Saul credit for this. We'll see the story he acted valiantly. He defeated the Amalekites. He delivered Israel from the hands of those who plundered them. As their commander-in-chief, he did lead them uh, into many good battles that God would lead them in. I hope this day Saul learned. We'll talk about that as we com continue. Then we have some genealogy. Uh, the sons of Saul were Jonathan, Ishvi, uh, Malkashua, and the names of his two daughters were these. Either one of these ring a bell to you? The name of his two daughters, the name of the firstborn, Merab, and the name of the younger, Michal. What is she famous for, Michal? Come on. Huh? He was David's wife. This is the, the daughter of Saul that Saul gave to King David 
uh, for a hundred. Uh, David actually gathered 200 foreskins of the Philistines, uh, and King Saul gave him Michal as a wife. Michal was David's first wife. The name of Saul's wife, uh, wife was Ahinoam, the daughter of Ahimatz, the name of the captain of his army. This is the only official that's named. He isn't family, uh, but they name him here Avner, Abner, uh, the son of Ner, Saul's uncle. He's the only official, like I said. He will be an important military leader in the chapters to come. Uh, so he gets his name introduced here to us. Kish was the father of Saul, more genealogy. Ner was the father of Abner, was the father uh, the, Kish was the father of Saul, and Ner, the father of Abner, was the son of Abiel, just genealogy. Uh, and 52, now the war against the Philistines was severe all the days of Saul. What should it have been? What should the war against the Philistines been? Should have been finished on this day. Should have been finished on this day, except for Saul's foolish oaths in weakening the army. So what does he get by weakening his army, uh, saying that his son Jonathan must die? The war against the Philistines was severe all the days of Saul. Not until King David would the Philistines finally be defeated. And when Saul saw any mighty man or any valiant man, he attached them to his staff. He was taking the sons of Israel just like God had Samuel uh, warn the people, the king is going to take the finest of your sons, your strength, and he's going to put them into his army He's going to have them run before him, and that's exactly what you see there. Anytime Saul would run across a young man in a field, uh, a strong man, he would just say, that man's coming with me, that man's coming with me. Uh, no questions to mom and dad. He belongs to the king's service. Exactly what the Lord warned would happen through Saul is happening now. It's playing out again. So much for the strong, handsome, broad-shouldered, good-looking uh, king that the people wanted. He is a disaster. And they had Yahweh as their king, the perfect creator, raising up judges when need be. And this is who God gave them. This is what they deserved, these idolatrous Israelites at this time in history. That's what they deserved. Let's close in prayer.